items. In one, we find broken glasses and crockery. Made in China. He must have felt safe in his bunkers. But even above ground, in a palace development like this, Saddam Hussein and his family were far removed from the Iraqi people and the real world. John Irvine, ITV News, Baghdad. Iraq war. Mr. Bush, so obviously in his element of the troops. But at the same time, Mr. Bush clearly brimming with confidence. Just listen to remarks he made off camera to those of us travelling with the White House press ball overnight into Doha. I'm a master of low expectations, the president said. I may not be a great analyst, but I'm terrific at getting people to relax. Hope, and I'm a great delegator. The president of the United States of America, George W. Bush. Before the troops, a note of triumph, yes, but also acknowledgement from the president that not all had gone to plan in Iraq and that the humanitarian crisis now has to be faced. Not only does the war on terror go on, but we got a lot of work to do in Iraq. And we're going to stay the course until the job gets done. And it was telling that at the end of this week, Mr. Bush was trying to address the furor over who did what with the truth about Saddam's weapons of mass destruction. One White House aide telling us overnight that the president's team had been, quote, shocked by the reaction in London. This is a man who spent decades hiding tools of mass murder. He knew the inspectors were looking for him. You know better than me, he's got a big country in which to hide him. We're on the look. We'll reveal the truth. The abiding image, however, today of a leader not on the defensive now on any front, and a man who, despite the doubts elsewhere, a man who believes that he's writing history. The chief UN arms inspector, Hans Blix, is much less optimistic. Delivering his final report to the UN Security Council before retiring, Mr Blix said he'd not found evidence of any dangerous weapons program being reactivated. This does not necessarily mean that such items could not exist. They might. There remain a long list, long list of items unaccounted for. But it is not justified to jump to the conclusion that something exists just because it is unaccounted for. While we've been on air, Belgian prosecutors have said they have detained a man of Iraqi nationality after a series of letters containing a nerve gas ingredient were sent to the Prime Minister's office and to the US and British embassies. We'll bring you more on that if we get it. Well, two of Saddam Hussein's daughters are believed to be applying for asylum in Britain. Ragad and Rana Hussein have been under house arrest in Iraq since 1996. The Home Office says they're under no obligation to take any asylum seeker involved in human rights abuses. It's not known how far the daughters were ever involved in the regime. A report to the Security Council Thursday. He said UN inspectors found no evidence that Iraq had restarted its chemical, biological or nuclear weapons program. But he points out that he can't conclude Iraq is free of banned weapons either. He's urging the US-led coalition to allow UN inspectors back into Iraq. Well, I think it's important to uh, retain the view that we all like to would want to see the truth about the situation in Iraq. And we, for our part, have, and I, for my part, have said that we wish the uh, inspectors, the people who are there now, the experts who are there on behalf of the US or the UK, we wish them best of luck. Uh, they have not found very much so far. Uh, we do also not find very much. The U.S. ambassador to the U.N. says there are no plans to allow U.N. inspectors back into Iraq. John Negroponte says the coalition now has responsibility for the search for banned weapons. But the British U.N. ambassador says his country is not opposed to a United Nations role in the hunt for Iraq's alleged weapons of mass destruction. We, uh, in 1483, uh, have made it clear as a council that we will return to the mandates of UNMAVIC and IAEA. Uh, we will do that uh, at whatever time the Council uh, judges it to be useful and appropriate. Uh, the United Kingdom is ready for that at any stage. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, there is uh, a lot of work to be done on the ground. 
U.S. President George W. Bush is expressing confidence the U.S. will eventually find banned weapons in Iraq. He visited U.S. troops based in Qatar on Thursday to thank them for their role in the invasion of Iraq. Mr. Bush says the U.S. will, quote, reveal the truth about Iraq's weapons programs, which he'd cited as the main reason for the invasion. Meanwhile, someone fired a rocket-propelled grenade at U.S. troops in the Iraqi city of Fallujah. The U.S. military says one U.S. soldier was killed in that attack. Well, hi there. This was a DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, report from September 2002, assessing Iraq's weapons of mass destruction. The report itself remains highly classified, but CNN has obtained a one-page unclassified summary, and it has quite a startling headline in this unclassified summary. It says, quoting, there is no reliable information on whether Iraq is producing and stockpiling chemical weapons or where Iraq has or will establish its chemical warfare agent production facilities. Now, as recently as yesterday, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld says he was confident the information on Iraq before the war was solid. My observation on the intelligence, although it's not my business, but I read it, uh, is that it's been, it's been good, it's been uh, enriched as they've gone through this past period of, of years, and that uh, I, I believe that the presentation made by uh, Secretary Powell was accurate and, uh, and will be proved to be accurate. Now, the DIA report basically is an assessment, and what they say is they cannot come to definitive conclusions, at least not back in September 2002. It's not to say that they didn't see some things going on in Iraq. The report says there was unusual activity last year, suggesting Iraq was distributing chemical munitions in anticipation of an attack. But they also place a lot of limits on what they think Iraq might have been able to do. They, the report says Iraq had chemicals and equipment to produce mustard agent, but that they could not have produced battlefield quantities of nerve agent, that they lack the chemicals, and that many of those facilities had been destroyed in previous U.S. attacks. So the bottom line is, back in December 2002, the Pentagon's own Defense Intelligence Agency said it lacked direct information on Iraq's chemical weapons, and it was unsure about their biological weapons. Veronica? Isn't this information going to force the hand of the Bush administration to come up with the truth about the information that it got, the whole truth, uh, about the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq? Well, the administration, of course, says that it has offered the truth, uh, that they have been as forthcoming as they possibly could be, going back to the president's speech to the United Nations, the State of the Union address, Secretary Powell's presentation to the United Nations, all laying the groundwork that they believe there was a genuine, true, and imminent threat from Iraq and its weapons of mass destruction program. The question that Congress, of course, is looking at is whether some of that intelligence was politicized, as it were, by the administration. The intelligence community comes up with assessments until they have a substance in hand. They don't really make definitive conclusions. The question on the table now is whether there was too much of a political slant put on that intelligence information. It's something the Congress is absolutely looking into. Veronica? Thank you, Veronica. And under close U.S. scrutiny and close guard from U.S. forces, that small team of seven uh, nuclear experts from the United Nations has now arrived in Baghdad to begin what they're calling a damage assessment of Iraq's largest nuclear facility. The Tawaitha plant outside the capital was left unguarded when U.S. forces took control of the area and was subsequently looted by local villagers. Iraqi scientists who have uh, uh, surveyed the site say the looters left behind piles of uranium and spilled radioactive materials, carrying away uh, things like the metal containers and the steel drums uh, that were used to store those materials and obviously leaving behind as well a very hazardous uh, situation. Uh, the mission of these UN experts is something uh, somewhat limited in scope. They're here to try and account for as much as possible any of those radioactive, radioactive materials that may have gone missing. But this is, we're told, not the resumption of UN efforts to track down Iraq's now elusive weapons of mass destruction, Veronica.
So, therefore, is this a mission uh, uh, whose emphasis is safety for the environment, for the community? That's certainly one of the issues that has to be look at, looked at. Uh, these, uh, these scientists from the IAEA, that UN uh, nuclear watchdog, will be uh, making sure or monitoring and reporting back uh, to their uh, authority, their supremos, uh, as to what the actual safety situation uh, is there. But their main function is to kind of write an inventory of, uh, of exactly what is there at the site, compare that with the inventories they had uh, before the, uh, the, uh, the looting took place, and to try and establish whether any of this radioactive material has gone missing, and if it has, where it may have gone to. W. Bush says he remains absolutely convinced that the evidence will turn up. Meanwhile, a United Nations team of inspectors visited the Tuwatha nuclear compound in Iraq under tight U.S. restrictions. The team is to determine how much nuclear material has been looted. Meanwhile, coalition forces are continuing their search for members of Saddam Hussein's former regime. 28 of the 55 most wanted have been taken into custody so far. Two others are believed to be dead. CNN's Ben Wiedemann spent several days exclusively embedded with a coalition unit carrying out that search and tells us why the hunt is still is not sitting well with some local residents. Roger, we monitored no civilian traffic is came by the uh, checkpoint. In the dead of night, officers of the 173rd Airborne Brigade tried to make sense of an operation in uncharted territory. Intelligence had indicated this stretch of the Tigris River, an hour north of Baghdad, had become a refuge for hardcore pro-Saddam holdouts. Their sweep initially netted a sleepy, bewildered group of children, women, the elderly, and a sprinkling of men. The Americans bound their hands behind their backs with plastic cuffs, detained them in the front yard of a house belonging to a former mid-level officer in the old regime. Later, the women and children were unbound and ushered inside. While the men were sorted and questioned outside, U.S. troops searched every room in the house. They found an AK-47 assault rifle and a few pistols. Nothing unusual in a country where firearms are considered an ordinary household appliance. By early morning, the American forces had failed to haul in the big fish they were looking for. This operation involved more than a thousand troops tasked with, among other things, searching for notorious figures from the old regime, including Ali Hassan al-Majid, otherwise known as Chemical Ali. Boats patrolled the Tigris River. Helicopters hovered overhead, all keeping an eye on anyone who might be trying to slip away. But among the men and teenage boys who were taken away for further questioning, there was no chemical Ali nor anyone else of renown. After a hectic night, the senior American officer explained why his men bound women and children. There's a lot of reports of uh, uh, young, young women, young kids walking up to Humvees and throwing grenades in. And for, for our own safety, and, and quite frankly, for their own safety, uh, because what it does, it uh, puts them into submissive mode. The commotion left those who weren't detained by the Americans angry and resentful. We were astounded, says Mohammed al Jabouri. We imagined the Americans would bring freedom and democracy. But the opposite has happened. In the dawn of the new relationship between the United States and Iraq, almost nothing is as anyone imagined. Ben Wiedemann, CNN, near Al Bilad in central Iraq. A short while ago. Well, U.S. forces continue to face difficulties and more attacks as they attempt to impose security across the more restive areas. Uh, of this country in the latest incident the details coming to us from u.s officials at centcom another u.s soldier has apparently been killed this time up near the syrian border uh, shot dead by unidentified attackers as they approached his u.s army checkpoint asking for medical assistance in a car he went over to provide that assistance when he was gunned down uh, in the firefight that followed one of the attackers was killed another one was arrested but uh, others apparently fled the scene that coming as the U.S. military saying its forces on patrol in the western Iraqi town of Fallujah 
have again come under attack, uh, saying gunmen fired at them uh, from a mosque in the centre of this majority Sunni uh, Muslim town, coming under fire from that mosque the second time in as many days. Hostility to U.S. forces in Fallujah has been running up high uh, since U.S. troops uh, killed at least 15 local residents in fierce clashes uh, between them uh, last month in April. Uh, more than 3,000 soldiers have been deployed there to increase security and increase the U.S. presence. But, you know, the kind of attackers uh, that are attacking U.S. forces blend in with the civilian population and strike at will. So it is a very, very difficult war for U.S. forces to fight. Matthew Chan. Yes, Zane, that was the first U.S. aircraft to be shot down uh, by hostile fire since the collapse of the regime of Saddam Hussein just two months ago. This Apache helicopter took hostile from the ground, as you mentioned, in an area about 145 kilometers west of Baghdad, which would put it roughly in the area around the town of Ramadi, which has long been something of a stronghold of anti-U.S. Uh, sentiment, the site of uh, several attacks against U.S. Uh, personnel in that area. Now, just a little while ago, David McKiernan, the general who is basically the commander of the coalition forces uh, in Iraq, commented upon that incident. We did have an Apache that was uh, struck by a hostile fire. Uh, both pilots are fine. And uh, it was uh, involved in an uh, in operation that we've had over the last uh, 24 to 48 hours. That operation is, is still uh, ongoing, so I'm, I won't go into any more specifics other than to say that we had what I termed earlier actionable intelligence, and we struck very lethally and very decisively. Now, in addition to the downing of the Apache helicopter, apparently an F-16 also crashed uh, during that raid. Apparently, we're told by U.S. officials as a result of mechanical uh, failure. Now, this raid also involved troops from the 101st Airborne uh, Division, who we were told were involved in a direct firefight with irregular forces in that area. No word on Iraqi casualty, casualties, but we are told uh, that one U.S. soldier was uh, slightly wounded in that incident. Now, we've seen basically since the beginning of this week, uh, Zane, that there has been an intensification of U.S. Uh, action around the, uh, the Baghdad area and also in the West. Now, beginning in the early hours of Monday morning, me and my crew uh, were uh, tagged along with the 173rd Airborne Division, which is operating in the Tikrit and Kirkuk areas, as they rounded up what appeared to be several hundred Iraqis, including women and children, in an operation dubbed Operation uh, Peninsula Strike. That occurred about 45 miles uh, north or 90 kilometers north of Baghdad in a peninsula that struts out, uh, sticks out into the Tigris uh, River. Now, the purpose of this strike was to round up uh, a continued sort of loyalists to the Ba'athist Party and pro Saddam elements. It included seaborne troops as well as helicopters uh, trying to uh, round up these individuals. We were told that in the end, about 400 people are being detained and questioned for their uh, in connection with the Ba'ath Party and uh, attacks against the United States forces in that area. In addition, the Americans were looking for Ali Hassan El Majid, uh, otherwise known as Chemical Ali. The Americans, we are told, were not successful in finding that individual. As far as casualties, somewhere between 10 and 15 Iraqis were killed in the operation. Four Americans were wounded. Three of them have been flown to Germany. But there's another battle in Fallujah, that of winning over the Iraqis, and that's been proving rather more difficult. Our correspondent, Neil Connery, is there. The dead of night in Fallujah, and U.S. forces are on the front line of Operation Desert Scorpion. Some 1,300 troops are searching homes looking for Saddam's sympathizers. Fallujah has been a center of resistance ever since the Americans arrived. This man is arrested and led away. A search uncovers a flare gun, but no other weapons are found inside this house. 12 gauge pistol, looks like a flare gun. 
40 American soldiers have been killed in attacks and ambushes in Iraq since the fall of Saddam two months ago. The US forces the last few days have seen a number of operations throughout Iraq aimed at trying to thwart the threat posed by Saddam's remaining loyalists. But no matter how successful they've been, they're aware that there are still people in this country willing to die either for a regime that is no more or because they want to try and force these troops from Iraq. In Fallujah, the Americans still face hostility, but this captain told me a change of approach had made an important difference. Over the last couple of weeks, they've had a change of responsibility of who's actually in charge of it, and uh, the 2nd Brigade of the 3rd ID now is responsible for this overall area. Uh, that's also the same brigade that went in and uh, was the lead or the spear of 3 ID into Baghdad. Elsewhere, the coalition say the former commander of the Iraqi Air Force, Hamid Raja Salal al-Takriti, is now in custody. Much has been achieved here, but for the frontline troops, many risks remain. Neil Connery, ITV News, 